Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Good after good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think everybody's in attendance. I'd like to call this uh, this meeting of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development to order. Um, uh, so my name's Tom Taggart. I'm the MLA for Colchester North and chair of this committee. Today we have uh, officials joining us virtually from Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration. Nova Scotia Power, IBEW Local 1928, and Clean Nova Scotia. So I ask everybody to please turn off their phones or put them on silent. <clears throat> please keep your masks on during the meeting unless you are speaking. And please try not to leave your seat during the meeting unless it's absolutely necessary. 
I will ask that I will now ask that the committee members uh, introduce themselves for the record by stating their name and constituency. And if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Mr. Mumberkett. Come down the front, and across the back, and around. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for for being with us. Uh, to all our presenters, Derek Mumberkett, MLA for City Member Two. Good afternoon, everyone. Carmen Kerr from Annapolis. Good afternoon, Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Lisa Lachance, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Dave Ritzy, MLA for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Kent Smith, I'm the MLA for the Eastern Shore. Good afternoon everyone, Trevor Boudreau, MLA for Richmond. Good afternoon, Chris Palmer, MLA, Kings West. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to also recognize the presence of uh, Chief Legislative Counsel G Gordon Hebb and Legislative Committee Clerk uh, Judy Kavanaugh, who is sitting in for Acting Committee Clerk uh, Sherry Mitchell. Today's topic will be uh, protecting employment in the transition from coal. And uh, so, I'd like to welcome all the witnesses. Uh, ask that they introduce themselves, uh, calling on them by order of the agenda. <clears throat> I think everybody has the list below, but, uh, and uh, ask them to begin with the, with the opening remarks. And uh, I think our first, we're gonna, we start with uh, Ms. Uh, Ava Zappale, uh, our Deputy Minister of uh, Labor, Skills, and Im Immigration. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, um, Ava Zappale. I'm the Deputy Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration, and I have with me my colleague, Nancy Hodnot, the Senior Executive Director of Skills and Learning. Nova Scotia Power, Mr. Gregg. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Peter Gregg. I'm the President and CEO of Nova Scotia Power, um, and I'm also joined by Mark Sidebottom, who is our Chief Operating Officer as well. And uh, Mr. Sponigal. Yeah, Jim Sponigal, uh, the business manager, financial secretary of IBW Local 1928. And Clean Foundation. Scott Skinner, president and CEO of the Clean Foundation. Thank you. Um, so uh, I. Uh, does, do uh, the witnesses uh, uh, have, are prepared to make some opening statements? Uh, start with uh, Ms. Sapele. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration's work to support the transition of jobs in Nova Scotia communities. Mr. Chair, Nova Scotia is on a path to phase out its fleet of coal-fired generation stations and transition to clean, renewable energy. The province is working collaboratively with federal and provincial partners to support this transition. While this department is not driving the Clean Power Project, we understand that we have an important role to play. The Department of Labour, Skills and Immigration will work with the communities and other departments, natural resources and renewables, environment and climate change, and economic development throughout this transition. We also look forward to working with Nova Scotia Power. We know they have been working to prepare for new opportunities and are working with their employees and union to, to plan for retraining, upskilling and transitioning workers. Whenever an industry transitions, we understand that this can impact individuals, families and communities. It can also create new opportunities. In this case, that includes economic growth and job opportunities driven by clean and renewable energy and increased demand from a growing population. LSI offers several programs and supports that help people retrain and retool for the next phase of their careers. For example, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency provides incentives to employers to register and employ apprentices through the Apprenticeship Start program. Skills Online NS provides free online training with hundreds of courses available to all individuals and businesses in Nova Scotia. Our 16 Nova Scotia Works providers serve more than 50 communities throughout the province, online and in person, and connect people to jobs and jobs to people. These are just a few examples of our programs and services, which are informed by labour market information and forecasts. 
It is estimated that the province will require more than 11,000 new certified tradespeople in 31 trades over the next 10 years due to recovery, new growth and retirements. This means there are opportunities for skilled Nova Scotians who work in the coal sector. They have helped fuel our province for generations. As we prepare for a clean energy future, their skills will continue to be needed. LSI looks forward to supporting them and the province in an efficient transition through ongoing collaboration and innovative solutions as clean energy plans are finalized. Thank you for your time. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, Ms. Hodnut, do you have any comments? No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Gregg, uh, President and CEO, Nova Scotia Power, any opening comments, sir? I do, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, thank please. You. Yep. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today on this important subject. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Deputy Minister Zappale and, and her team. Um, also by Scott Skinner from uh, the Clean Foundation, as I mentioned earlier, by uh, our own Chief Operating Officer, Mark Sybottom, whose role is dedicated to leading our transition away from coal. And in particular, I'd also like to thank uh, Jim Sponagle, the head of our union, the local 1928 of the IBW, for joining us in this important discussion today. It's under Jim's leadership uh, that our union has been integral to the work that has been done to date to ensure that we have the right plans, the right supports in place for our employees as we transition away from coal to a cleaner energy future. Um, and it's vital, it's a vital partnership, and we are grateful for, for Jim's ongoing support. Um, these kinds of opportunities for the type of dialogue and discussion we're having today is essential as we work uh, together toward a clean energy future for our province and indeed for all Nova Scotians. Climate change is a real concern for all of us and I can assure you that Nova Scotia Power is committed to keeping uh, and meeting government's environmental goals because it's the right thing to do. We live and we work in communities across this great province, so we share in the vision of a clean energy future for our families, for our friends, and for our neighbors. And for decades, our coal-fired power plants have provided firm, reliable, dispatchable generation, and we've delivered that reliable electricity to customers. But while we recognize that coal has been an important part of the Nova Scotia history, we know it cannot be part of our future which is why we have steadily added more renewable energy to the system and our team of approximately 2,000 employees has led one of the fastest transitions to renewables in Canadian history. Over the past 15 years, we've been on a path of greening the grid as we transition away from coal. And since 2005, we've reduced carbon emissions by 34% and our use of coal by 43% over that same time period. We've also tripled renewable energy output from 9% in 2005 to 30% over the last decade, and we're on track to achieve 60% clean energy this year in 2022. We've made good progress that our team um, is certainly proud of. That progress has also been made possible by our parent company, Amera. In early 2021, Amera announced its climate commitment for all of its affiliates, a set of clear goals on the path to net zero, including achieving a 55% CO2 reduction by 2025 and by at least 80% by 2040 compared to 2005 levels. As we look to next steps, our employees continue to be first and foremost in our minds and in our planning. We have approximately 400 potentially impacted employees at four generating sites in the province, and they are our top priority in this transition. The most important element in our planning is the focus on care for our employees, their families, and the communities in which they live. In 2020, we established an internal working group whose primary focus is on supporting employees during this transition. Members of this group include several human resource leads and specialists, seasoned operational leads from the plants, government relations and communications leads as well. And through this group and in close collaboration with our union, we've committed to being the first and best source of information about the transition for all of our employees. We've been meeting early and often about plans and sharing what we know as we know it. Feedback from our team has shown us how they appreciate this high level of transparency. We're also committed to developing individual plans in collaboration with each of our employees who will be impacted to help chart their path forward. And we will be leveraging best practices and lessons learned from similar 
changes and, and transitions in the company over the years within Nova Scotia Power, but also uh, across our other Amera affiliates that have gone through similar transitions. Also in collaboration with our union, last year we established local transition teams at each of our coal plants where we know there will be impacts to jobs in the coming years. We've also established a central transition team to bring together representatives from each of the local plants to collaborate and regularly share information, learning and ideas. We will also continue to engage with our employees to help define their individual paths forward, which could include training for new roles both inside and outside the business as we transition to that cleaner energy future. At the same time, we recognize we don't have all of the answers right now, and if we are going to do this right, we know we can't do it alone. We are proactively reaching out and working with government to ensure, ensure a shared understanding uh, of options for our employees. This is, in part, what led to our joint submission together with our union to, the natu to Natural Resources Canada in September of 2021 to develop a just transition task force for this transition. We've been committed to a just transition for over 15 years on our journey to more renewable sources of energy. Change is constant in our business and it's ingrained in our culture to put the care and safety of our employees first. We've also met with local municipal officials in areas where there will be job impacts to discuss our planning and our commitment is to continue this dialogue. As we continue our path to transitioning off coal and achieving 80% renewable energy by 2030, we know we have the opportunity to assist in creating and supporting a green powered economy, which will create more jobs and more opportunities for Nova Scotia power employees, as well as businesses and organizations, both large and small across Nova Scotia. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Sidebottom, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Sponigal, do you would you like any comments before we start? Sorry, I think you're muted, sir. I'm mute, Jim. There. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers is the largest union of electrical workers in the world, nearly 700,000 members. In Nova Scotia, the IBW 1928 represents approximately one half of Nova Scotia Power Workforce. Um, I started as, uh, as an employee of Nova Scotia Power back in 1995, became a local union president in 2012, uh, and for the past six plus years, I've been the business manager of the local union uh, and represent members right across the company. Um, work in the electrical utility sector, sec sector is extremely complex. Our members working at Nova Scotia Power are highly skilled and have significant impact ensuring the safe, effective operation of the utility. Most of our members are individuals with highly skilled trades or specialized occupations. In addition, many jobs can be physically demanding and dangerous. Our long history working with Nova Scotia Power has led to a strong, positive working relationship. Um, where we share a common uh, a commitment of safety and operational excellence. I'll be uh, the first to say we have not always agreed on everything as a business manager of the local union, uh, but over the years I've worked through a collective bargaining, arbitrations, grievances. Uh, we also work together through a major transition uh, as the company has evolved and workforce requirements change. But together we've never wavered in our shared commitment to health, safety, and care of employees. When it comes to the current work uh, to achieve the government's environmental goals, Nova Scotia Power and the IBW are working together to align in our plans to support employees, IBW members in meaningful transition as we move to cleaner, future cleaner sources of electric, electricity for Nova Scotians. Uh, as Peter mentioned, we worked together uh, last fall on the joint transition submission to the federal government. IBW, IBW plays a vital role in supporting employees in the electricity sector and ensuring their effective representation. Uh, it is our intention to continue to advocate for employees through and following the, the transition and to continue to grow our membership. Uh, to that end, we are actively seeking opportunities for our members in clean energy uh, job, jobs, or inter whether internal or external to Nova Scotia Power. Uh, from my perspective, on behalf of IBW, we're seeing many here today uh, 
we see this meeting here today as an opportunity to step in the right direction of having the right support in place uh, and do, to do uh, the right thing for our membership, by our, mem by our membership. Uh, we share a commitment to the just transition and thoughtful engaging process of those, uh, those impacted. Thank you again for the opportunity today. And I look forward uh, to your questions, to continuing the ongoing discussion and collaboration to come. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Skinner, would you have any opening comments? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you for inviting me to contribute today to today's standing committee discussion. Uh, at the Clean Foundation, we are an environmental nonprofit that strives to help communities transition to a clean, low carbon economy. Part of that work includes helping communities through workforce development programs focused on facilitating career opportunities in the clean economy sector. Through our experience in supporting the growth of the sector, we know that there are and will be significant opportunities for impact, impacted workers with the proper planning and supports. Uh, the workforce development programs we currently deliver are growing rapidly. Uh, we've seen a large increase in employer interest uh, as some labour markets face challenges uh, filling existing roles. With the right skill set has quickly become a job seekers market and we have uh, yet to really begin to, to bend the emission curve down towards the 2030 goals included in the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act passed in the fall of 2021. Our, our broader experience also tells us that one size fits all transition plans are, are unlikely to work. Um, through delivering uh, many programs across Nova Scotia, we know that communities and potential program participants need to be engaged from the beginning to understand their needs and concerns. In our opinion, any workforce transition plans needs, needs to be designed for the workers the in the specific communities and people impacted, uh, not necessarily focused on the employer or fit within existing government support programs. Further, it is our opinion that the complexities of a just transition need to be addressed through planning well before job losses are experienced. Depending on the situation and scale of the job transition, it's necessary to have options, uh, including tools like wage subsidies and wraparound services for job seekers and employers. These need to be ready to go before workers experience change. Uh, we're here to talk about coal today, but there are most certainly other industries that will experience profound change in this decade and will require similar attention. There will be many jobs that need to be filled to successfully reduce emissions while we continue to grow the Nova Scotia economy. It's a challenging opportunity, but one in which we must get right as a province if we were to live up to our com uh, commitments laid out in the unanimously supported Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, that concludes the opening remarks. And uh, so I'm going to begin with the question and ask, answer uh, a period. I, uh, I asked everybody to please uh, wait until I say their name before they speak. Uh, and uh, to speak, I asked uh, folks to uh, indicate by raising their hands. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'm going to try and wrap up questioning by 2.40, uh, and uh, we'll move on to other committee business. Um, I'll do my best to uh, do my best to, uh, we're working here under the rotational where everybody gets to speak once before the, uh, before anybody gets their second question and I will do my absolute best to keep things in order and uh, and run run through that way. So at this point, uh, oh, and the other thing I'd like to ask is that uh, indicate who, uh, who you're addressing your question to. So uh, I'm looking for hands, MLA Boudreau. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the witnesses for their opening remarks. And um, certainly this is an important topic. I think we all recognize uh, the importance of uh, moving towards um, green, green energy in this province. And, and, um, but I will say as a, as a member who has a, a generating plant in my constituency, you know, we do definitely have concerns with how, employee, how things will unfold for employees. And we're looking forward to hearing some of those strategies and, and how things will move forward. Um, Ontario closed their coal plants uh, in the early 2010s. Uh, Alberta's last plant should close in the next year. Um, what did, and I'm going to ask this question, I guess these questions to Nova Scotia Power and to Mr. Skinner. Um, what did these provinces do to prepare uh, their coal plant workers and their communities where these were located? And have we learned anything from these jurisdictions and some lessons that can uh, be applied to this transition that we're going to be going through? So thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. I'd like uh, maybe Mr. Gregg would answer first, and then I'll go to Mr. Skinner. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Boudreau, for the question. I actually had the opportunity to work in the Ontario uh, electricity market during that period, so I have some firsthand um, knowledge of that. I wasn't engaged in the direct conversations um, uh, with the, the coal plants at that time. I was in another part of the of the industry, but was very involved from a from a planning perspective. And I think there are some really important lessons to learn there. I think one and and. Scott Skinner touched on this, is that, you know, over time, um, there are new opportunities that are presented by the transition away from the more traditional um, to the new cleaner uh, generating technologies. And uh, we have seen in Ontario um, business opportunities, um, job opportunities, training opportunities uh, develop. And that has been a real positive story that we can learn from. The other part of it, though, from a high level, is that um, the issue of making sure um, we do the transition in a way that is an affordable one for all, all Nova Scotians. And that is one of the most important lessons that I think can be learned from the Ontario context. Um, that there were some decisions made there that uh, contributed uh, significant cost uh, onto uh, energy uh, ratepayers, customers, um, that I think we can avoid here as we manage our, our transition. And that's front and center in our mind uh, as we do this, not only you know making sure we're working closely with each and every one of our employees affected, but that when we make decisions around the replacement energy for that coal, that we're doing so that it's you know a reliable and safe, but also you know affordable for for our customers, and that uh, that is one of the most important lessons we can learn from Ontario. Thank you, sir, Mr. Sidebottom or uh, Skinner. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to comment on this question. Uh, I'm, um, uh, you know, not as familiar with with uh, you know what happened on the ground as as, as Peter may have been uh, given his time in Ontario, uh, you know, and and as well with with Alberta. Um, but you know, I would suggest like we have an opportunity here uh, in Nova Scotia that um, we have a pretty good line of sight onto when um, the coal plants are going to go offline, and we have a very good line of sight on uh, the policy measures that are going to be put into place around uh, reducing emissions, uh, adding renewable energy to the grid, that we can, we can plan around it in a way that works for the communities in your constituency, uh, Member Boudreau. Um, you know, I, th I think in in uh, in general, over uh, to this date, within within uh, across Canada, we probably haven't done a, as good a job as as we probably could have around this notion of just transition. It's been talked about for quite a while. Um, there's a task force that I think started in 2017, and 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 really, you know, starting to come out with with uh, um, you know uh, information that coming out of it uh, just just recently last year. So, um, you know, what I would reiterate again is we we have like a the, the opportunity here in Nova Scotia to set out um, a plan um, with like pretty good idea when when it when things need to happen so I'm really hopeful that we can we can do that and make sure that we have the opportunities that are there for for people that are, are going to be impacted thank you thank you very much sir uh, next I have MLA Palmer please thank you mr. chair uh, as uh, my friend Mr. Boudreau has uh, said, it's a very important topic that we're discussing today. And uh, with the, all the new opportunities uh, and the transition that we're going to be going through, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of anxiety amongst a lot of people out there. And it's so uh, comforting to know that there's a lot of plans and uh, a lot of uh, thought being put into uh, how we're going to work with workers going forward. Um, I'd like to address my question to Mr. Skinner. Um, and you had mentioned in your opening statement that uh, not only is this transition away from coal uh, affecting not just the workers, but their families and communities. Um, could you talk to us a bit more and maybe expand on what you mentioned uh, and discuss some of the work that uh, goes into supporting the communities uh, that we're going to be seeing going forward uh, now and going forward, if you could clarify and expand on that. Yeah, th thank you for, for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, w w what I was referring to in my opening comments was like, um, you know, there's a, there's a number of sectors uh, and, and, and um, areas of work right now that will be impacted. Like, uh, you know, allow yourself to imagine, um, you know, the impacts to um, 
businesses in your community around the switch from internal combustion engine uh, vehicles to to electric vehicles. Uh, this will impact a lot of different, um, you know, parts of, uh, you know, mechanic shops, uh, car dealerships, um, you know, uh, electricians will be needed to install charging infrastructure. And I mean, you know, th th there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, you know, so I, I think at, at, at this point, uh, you know, we, we should be thinking pretty soon about um, doing a sort of like uh, a vulnerable sector uh, review. And, and seeing what that looks like down at the community level, and then uh, getting out into those communities around the province and, um, and, and talking to the businesses about it. Like, there, there's enough, um, you know, directional certainty on a clean economy transition that uh, people should not be surprised. But uh, right now, like, we too often talk about this stuff anecdotally without uh, having, you know, really a good understanding of what that transition is going to look like. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, I have MLA Kerr, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My question is for DM uh, Zappale. Uh, there's a role for skills, Department of Skills, Labor, and uh, Immigration <clears throat> in uh, rolling out programs or skills development for uh, these workers. So I guess you had mentioned Nova Scotia Apprentices apprenticeship agency, which I'm aware of, Skills Online, but could you give us some more detail of those programs and how they'll help these particular workers in this uh, skill development or, or transition? Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question and really pleased to hear in the opening remarks from Nova Scotia Power that the the workers are highly skilled workers and many of these workers uh, do practice a trade and that's our understanding as well and um, um, many members of this committee will be aware of the fact that we're we need about 11,000 apprentices in 31 trades over the next few years there are lots of jobs for people uh, to practice skilled trades here in Nova Scotia and uh, we we're really hopeful that um, some of the workers will consider um, applying their trade or, or um, gaining a new trade as they transition their career. So on, on that piece, we're, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity to work. And um, Mr. Boudreau mentioned Cape Breton, and definitely we know that there's a lot of, of um, trades-related projects ready to go in Cape Breton that require skilled trades workers. So we're, we're hopeful that there's some opportunities there. So um, labor skills and immigration, um, we, what we do is we help uh, communities in transition, employers in transition. We work with employers to um, help with the transition piece where they need help. And we also work with employers, employees rather, who are seeking assistance as they transition to a new career. And so we do that through a number of ways, both online and um, and in, through our Nova Scotia Works offices that are throughout Nova Scotia, um, helping the helping the workers um, both assess their skill set and determine what skills they need to transition to another another opportunity. And my colleague Nancy Hodnot heads up our skills and learning branch. And if there's time, I'd like her to just be specific on a, a few of the things that we are able to offer. Ms. Hodnot, please. Thank you. So uh, as the deputy mentioned, and actually coming off a number of the comments this morning, um, there's incredible work happening within Nova Scotia Power in terms of supporting its employees to transition over the next number of years. And we're certainly working with Nova Scotia Power, keeping abreast with your HR people around what those plans are and what the timelines and potential impacts are in the next year, next two years, next five years plus. Um, and the other piece is, uh, again, uh, with a highly skilled workforce, it's slightly different than if you're working with a group of individuals who need significant training to reattach to the labor market. And so we are keeping abreast of what the opportunities will be internally for staff to find other employment opportunities within NS Power. Uh, what are the training uh, pieces that NS Power will be building into its plan? I know the uh, the proposal and you've been and NS Power has been very open with sharing the planning and the submissions to Natural Resources Canada that has some pieces in there around labor market training and transition. So we are aware of those pieces as well. But in the interim, for individuals who are thinking about 
uh, staying within the company or looking to branch out into other opportunities in the province. There's certainly an ability to access Nova Scotia Works at any point in time. We have an online channel now that individuals can go in and sort of look at what their current skill set is, where there may be opportunities in their communities or across the province. And that's, that can be accessed again through Nova Scotia Works Online or by visiting a Nova Scotia Works office. There's always supports to help people look at their resumes and, and, and just think about their career and their career planning again through NS Works. So those opportunities are there. And I wanna come back to another issue uh, that, that, uh, that Scott Skinner mentioned as well around wage subsidies. We have an ongoing array of programming and supports for individuals who are actually displaced from their workplace, so they become unemployed. We have that funding envelope here all the time. And so we can, we can help, um, because we have time in this particular, particular transition, to think about how that funding envelope and that program sort of like, uh, it's like a, it's a start program which has a wage subsidy attached to it. And so if there are individuals who are displaced and a wage subsidy can help in some of those local communities, that program is ongoing and can be massaged to meet certain very particular and specific needs related to this workforce. So basically to sum it up, we have a number of programs and ongoing support streams that we have. And it's really just being in regular communication with NS Power as the plans unfold to understand what are the things we need to sort of maybe enhance or put into play um, as the transition happens. Thank you very much, uh, MLA Lachance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Esponagal, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to uh, recognize and it was great to hear um, about how the union has been engaged, even um, if at points sometimes the discussion has been difficult. Um, you know, we, we know that it's really important to have labor, particularly labor connected with communities as uh, a leading voice in this transition. So I'm wondering if you could uh, take some more time to tell us a bit about how your members are feeling about the closure of the plants. Um, are they getting enough information? So we've heard about some of the programs and resources that are available. Um, are folks able to access those? What kinds of community level engagement has been happening? And I think, you know, just recognizing too, we heard from Mr. Skinner about how one, one size doesn't fit all. Um, so yeah, just wanting to hear about specific community experiences thus far um, and access to information. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spinegal. Yes, uh, I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. Uh, again, Nova Scotia Power uh, came around probably mid-year last year. Uh, went to the multiple thermal plants, and we, uh, you know, we 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 talked about the transition from uh, from fossil fuel or coal to renewable to renewable uh, green energy, and the impacts that uh, you know it's going to have on the business. And you know, the vision is to by 2030 to to be off of coal, no longer be burning a coal as a source of uh, source of power generation. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's six units in Cape Breton. Uh, Cape Breton are resilient people. Um, you know, they, they, they took the information, internalized it. Um, there was a lot of questions. Uh, initial, initially, you know, there was a lot, there was a, there's a lot of, there was a lot of buzz. Uh, we've got, uh, We've got a couple of plants, uh, units in the mainland in New Glasgow, and, and again, a lot, lot of questions come out of the initial meetings. Uh, it's a big transition. It's over time. Uh, uh, we're in the infancy stages of the transition, so uh, like I say, the employer and the union set up transition committees, local committees, uh, in each of the, the thermal plants. Um, so. If there's any questions, they're vetted through the transition committees, and then we've got a central committee uh, that, when I'm available, I participate on. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. It's it's a it's a changing world. The world's been changing ever since I've been born, '67, and my grandfather, like I say, he was a horse and buggy, and when he died, there were people going to the moon, right? Uh, so the world will continue to change, and it changes daily, and we've got to change with it. Uh, I don't look at it from a pessimistic standpoint. Uh, you know, coal will be eventually phased out, and I look at uh, trying to leverage the opportunities that uh, electrification is going to present itself to our members. Uh, certainly, I'm not an advocate of uh, 
you know, of employees going elsewhere, Nova Scotia Power employees. Uh, I don't uh, engage in any political discussion with Nova Scotia Power and the government. Uh, like with Nancy, I don't believe I met Nancy before, had any, no discussions there. So I look at it as, uh, you know, one step at a time, we'll get through it together. And, uh, you know, by having collaborative relationships with the employer, we'll, uh, we'll work together and try to minimize the impact of the transition. That's, that's all I can do, one day at a time. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, MLA Mombarquette, please. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, good comment, Jim. We are a resilient bunch in Cape Breton. Uh, good to see you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate all the presenters being uh, with us today, um, and I appreciate the conversations that I've had with many of you over the years as my time as Energy Minister, um, and how important this transition is going to be for, for the province. Um, as as I already been stated, there are a number of uh, there's a large number of workers that will be part of the transition, and, and we want to make sure that we we do whatever we can to support them. Um, I guess really my first question would be for for Nova Scotia Power for for either uh, representative um, in talking about the transition and talking about. Uh, the, the eventual shutdown of plants. A lot of this is really uh, dependent on the Atlantic Loop, and and what what that what that conversation uh, is like, where it's going with the feder with the feds in the province. And I guess my first question is, uh, as we talk about worker transition, do you want to, if you can provide just some of the opportunities that will be presented to Nova Scotia uh, in in the eventuality of if the federal government approves. Uh, the loop project uh, and, and, and the opportunities really for for your employees thank you uh, who wants to take that which of uh, I'll take it mr. chair it's Peter okay um, it's uh, <coughs> mr. Craig please yeah sorry yes uh, yeah, um, <laughs> thank you and uh, hello mr. member Kett. nice to see you again um, and thanks for the question I, I'll start and then I can invite mark into the discussion as well so a lot of discussion around Atlantic Loop and that is an important uh, feature that we are working um, jointly on with the provincial government but also neighboring utilities um, and provincial governments and neighboring jurisdictions to to bring that together but it's all based on our approach our shared collaborative approach to achieving the off coal requirement by 2030 that is set in legislation. But doing that in such a way that yes, it removes coal from our system or replaces it with renewables, but does that in an affordable way. And so that's really what led us to, in our detailed planning, um, to look at adding to the existing renewable resource base in Nova Scotia, leveraging the clean power that comes over the maritime link from uh, Newfoundland, but also this Atlantic Loop concept, which really is the completion of that loop by building a transmission line um, from Nova Scotia into Quebec to tap into their, um, you know, vast renewable resources that they've got there. And so that that is the plan. It's not only that transmission line. That'll allow us to shut down about half of these plants that we've got in Nova Scotia, but it's the portfolio of solutions, including that transmission line, transmission line to uh, Newfoundland that's already there, and then leveraging renewable resources here in Nova Scotia and technologies like grid scale storage <clears throat> to help optimize that renewables in, in uh, the province. And to uh, <clears throat> answer more specifically your question, um, you know, we're having ongoing discussions. Um, Mark is leading um, a team here at Nova Scotia Power in those discussions. Um, as I mentioned, we continue to, to work collaboratively with the provincial government. Um, we're having regular meetings with the federal government representatives um, led out of the Privy Council office in Ottawa. Um, actually, we had our most recent meeting last Friday. Um, and I'd say they're, they're going uh, well. Discussions are, are there. What it comes down to is to keep this an affordable transition for Nova Scotians is we need help. We need um, funding support from the federal government and that's what our ask is. Um, and so we're, we're having those 
I'd say fruitful discussions. I do worry that 2030 is not far away, um, and we need to we need to uh, get to some decisions sooner rather than later. Um, the discussions have been great, but getting to some decisions, and I think there's an understanding of that sense of urgency um, among all parties involved in those discussions. Mark, I don't know if I left you any room there, but anything you'd you'd add? I think you covered it uh, well, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mumpkin, was there a second question there at the end that I may have not have no, gotten we'll to? Go. Okay. No. Nope. Thank you, sir. Uh, MLA LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and hello, everyone. Um, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North, filling in for MLA Claudia Chender. And I have a question for Mr. Skinner. Um, um, Mr. Skinner, can you talk a little bit, we've, uh, in your opening remarks you talked a little bit about uh, the just transition, um, but I just would love to know from your point of view um, and imagining what it will be like, uh, what does or what will the just transition look like when if communities uh, like Mr. Boudreaux's community and all the different communities that are affected um, by uh, us getting off coal uh, and workers are at the center, and what are the missed, uh, pardon me, what are the risks and missed opportunities if there is not a significant increase in spending on a just transition uh, to the green economy starting with this year's budget? Thank you, uh, Mr. Skinner, please. Yeah, uh, th thank you for the question. Um, yeah, honestly, if I if I look at like what we have to do over the next uh, you know years to the end of the decade, like we're going to need everybody. <laughs> there's there's frankly uh, a huge amount of work that needs to be done on things like energy efficiency, uh, you know, small scale renewables, large scale re renewables. Um, you know. Uh, I, I worry less about um, there being jobs than, than we bring people along to the jobs that they want. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we need to ramp up investment in all these things really quickly. It takes, it takes a while to build capacity and to, and to you know, um, get these, get these uh, actions moving in communities, whether it's like building electric vehicle charging stations or deep energy retrofits. Like, it, it takes a while to get that bus moving. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I'd like to see, uh, you know, people working on these projects in their own community and have opportunities to do that. And I think we can also look at um, specific communities that are experiencing change and direct programming uh, uh, support and, and investment directly to them. Um, you know, for, for to, to date, a lot of like programming that uh, an investment that looks at this stuff will be, you know, look at uh, a geographic area like a province and set pretty rigid uh, eligibility rules and then everybody has equal access. Um, and then you go from there. Um, I, I think we have to move beyond that. And so if you look at a community that's like having this, uh, you know, change uh, affected on them by policy, let's just go in there and uh, let's put them to work. Um, and before we decide to do that, let's make sure that they are, you know, ha have the training, um, you know, the, the companies that are, that are doing the hiring, whether those are, um, you know, whatever type they are, um, are able to pay them well for the work that they're doing. Like we're, we're seeing inflationary uh, costs in the community. We're, we're seeing housing and, and, and rent costs go through the roof. So we're gonna have to make sure that people are paid well uh, as they move from one job to the next. But, um, you know, in general, I think that there's, uh, you know, we, we have a, we will have more trouble finding people to do the work in some of the areas of our province um, than, than we think we will right now. Like. Um, I would suspect that um, we're going to need more than 11,000 uh, people in the trades over the next decade. Thank you, sir. Uh, MLA Ritzy, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is going to be directed towards the uh, members uh, from Nova Scotia Power. What steps have been taken to prepare the Nova Scotian energy grid for the unique demands or necessities of different cleaner methods of energy production? Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Greg, you gonna take that? I think I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Sidebottom to take that, if that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Sidebottom. Thank you, and thank you for the question. There's been a significant uh, investment over the years, you know, getting ready for uh, the renewable generation. Um, there has been new transmission infrastructure built around uh, the province to uh, connect uh, renewable energy. 
And as we look forward to the next eight years, as we really do uh, the off-coal transition, there's a need to enhance the transmission line. So as Mr. Gregg said, uh, the Atlantic Loop is a key part, and a piece of that is actually infrastructure in Nova Scotia that needs to be enhanced. So it allows for the two-way flow of energy and actually helps uh, increase the grid's ability to take more wind energy. So some of the early steps that are happening now is there's uh, uh, going to be new wind added to the grid. Uh, there is currently an RFP out and uh, you know that is going to enhance uh, and lower the carbon footprint in this province. And so we're gonna get the grid ready for that. And that's one of many ways in which we can be ready for the future. Uh, in, as we you know, get towards a near, uh, near zero carbon footprint in Nova Scotia for the electrical grid. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Emily Smith, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here. Um, my question is going to be directed towards Mr. Skinner, um, and I was I was happy to hear your response to to Ms. LeBlanc's question because mine's similar but going to go a little bit deeper. Um, obviously, we're talking about protecting employment, but there's also an element here of creating employment as well. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about the Clean Leadership Summer Internship Program and how that can be helpful in the transition from coal. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. Please. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, our, our clean leadership program has been supported by the provincial government for a very long time, uh, including Nova Scotia uh, uh, labor skills, immigration, and environment, climate change. Um, it, it's it's a fantastic program that's like been growing every year because uh, employers uh, in the clean economy are, are becoming more and more interested in, in offering up more positions for students. And alongside of that, students have, have shown overwhelming interest in it. Um, we have a huge amount of uh, students apply every year. So these roles end up in all kinds of different types of organizations, whether they be clean tech, uh, energy efficiency, solar, uh, environmental conservation type uh, roles. Um, it, it, it really is like uh, setting young people up for a career in uh, the low carbon economy, transitioned economy, um, workplace. And, you know, I, I would say that like some of the things that we're doing in that program, you know, although it's focused on returning students, like the same tenets would hold to support people who are going through a mid-career transition, which are more likely to be affected by this particular, uh, you know, coal transition. But um, with, without question, like young people working in the clean economy is good for communities. The, the clean leadership program is, uh, is just as many placements in uh, rural, rural uh, organizations across Nova Scotia as there are in the HRM. So it, it, it's covering, you know, a pretty wide swath of, of, the, of the province. And, uh, you know, it's as these companies are, are finding more positions for youth, uh, you know, in these internship roles, they for sure will be finding more roles for people of uh, older, um, you know, mid-career um, uh, looking for change. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have MLA uh, Boudreau next, and this is our, we're going into our second round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, hearing some good remarks from, from the witnesses and some good questions from, from the colleagues here. Um, again, I'm going to go back to kind of being a rural community that has uh, a generating plant uh, there. Um, you know, maybe this is for Mr. Skinner. Um, from your experience with working with communities, what, what should these communities uh, be doing to prepare for these, these plant closures? Mr. Skinner? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I, I think some of the stuff is happening right now with, uh, you know, the work happening with uh, NSP and uh, IBEW and, and, and Nova Scotia Labour and Skills and Immigration. I mean, getting ahead of, of, of when and, and, and how these, um, you know, uh, job changes are, are, are going to occur. Um, you know, the other, I think, would be it's incumbent on, you know, government in general and organizations like mine to make clear, like, what other opportunities there are in the community around clean economy transition. Um, you know, there, there will be other jobs that, like, won't be at NSP around this that may be attractive to people who, who are being experienced by it. And, and, I, and I encourage you to think, like, more than just um, you know, sort of the the, he um, the physical labor technical roles, um, you know, if a company's uh, installing solar panels, they also need people who do sales administration and accounting. 
Um, there's there's other there, the, any organization that is you know involved in the clean econ uh, clean uh, economy transition uh, is a, a company that has a, a diversity of roles. So I, I think we need to you know get out there and talk more with um, you know, the communities that are going to be impacted and uh, see how like the investments in uh, policy that will run out of the environmental goals and, and climate change reduction act will provide opportunities for them. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. And uh, MLA Mumberkett. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm going to continue on the on the uh, the topic of of the loop. Um, and I think it's important. Uh, well, it is very important based on the comments that we've already heard from uh, from the CEO of NSP. Uh, how important that infrastructure is going to be for government to, to really hit the targets that they want based on their legislation. Um, you know, over the years, we, we've continued to increase our efficiency programs, increase uh, many of the programs that Nova Scotians utilize every day. Um, but these larger infrastructure projects uh, that, that may exist um, will really help with that transition, uh, I, I believe, of, of not only Nova Scotia power employees, but it will provide hundreds of opportunities for, for skills trades across the province. I guess my question is, is that in the event that the Atlantic Loop does not happen, uh, what happens to the targets uh, set out to close the plants, uh, and also what happens to power rates? So that, that's my question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to ask Mr. Greg to respond to that, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mubarakett, for the question. Um, so I'd start by saying that, you know, in the utility business, we we build long term assets to serve customers. That's sort of how we're wired. And so we do a lot of planning, we do a lot of engineering, and we do a lot of scenario development. And so when you can go and, and look at our integrated resource plan that was completed a couple of years ago with a lot of consultation from people across this great province. Um, and it came up with options for what the clean future is going to look like. And partly based on that work, uh, but partly based on our own um, internal planning, we uh, determined that the most uh, viable, affordable, reliable way to get to um, a cleaner grid was to focus on what I mentioned before. It includes the Atlantic Loop, but it also relies on a portfolio of cleaner solutions inside the province. So that is really plan A for us. Um, and, and put it all together, we believe it's the most affordable solution for Nova Scotians. But what I said about planning, we wouldn't be good at our jobs or doing what we need to do if we didn't have other scenarios developed. And so um, there are other ways of getting to 2030, um, but we think that we've got the, the best plan A and that's where our, our energies are focused uh, at the moment. Um, but I think it's also important to say that as the utility, we have to um, respond um, to the legislation and it really is an obligation on us as the utility to meet those 2030 targets. And so we feel we feel that obligation. Um, safe to say we feel that pressure being 2022 uh, that we need to have the, the right plans in place to do it. Um, and, and we will do everything in our power um, to meet those targets that are set for us. But we need to make sure we do that in a way that is a responsible, so it's an affordable transition for everyone, it's an equitable transition, uh, it's a reliable transition, and it sets us up for, um, you know, potential for, you know, we're talking about 80% renewables by 2030. There's a lot of talk about net zero when we as a corporation have goals for net zero. And so it also sets us up for that next step beyond 80. And that really is the, the plan A that we talk about that includes the Atlantic Loop. Thank you, sir. MLA Palmer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I as well want to commend all my colleagues and uh, all of you who have appeared uh, as witnesses today for the great questions and the responses uh, that uh, we're hearing. And it's definitely a lot uh, that has been happening and a lot to learn from today. Um, uh, it was mentioned about 11,000 trades uh, positions that will be needed over the next decade. Uh, and that was a staggering number. And um, 
that's, as Mr. Skinner said, will be a combination of uh, young people going into school, uh, but as well, uh, what we're discussing here uh, is the transition uh, from uh, the coal and uh, the retraining opportunities. So each person's circumstances are, are unique uh, and their ability to access retraining services um, could be different in different uh, circumstances. So I would like to address this question to Ms. Zappale or Ms. Uh, Hodnot. Um, could you talk to us about the impact that age and other demographic factors um, might have on uh, a worker's ability to access any retraining services that would be available? Thank you, sir. And who's going to, which, uh, who's speaking? Uh, Perhaps I'll start, yep, Mr. Please. Taggart. Yep. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, we do need um, many, many more skilled uh, trades workers in Nova Scotia. And um, we have a plan as to how we'll go about increasing the number of skilled trades workers and do so very purposefully over the next few years. But uh, our plan includes um, recruiting Nova Scotians and promoting the fantastic jobs that are available for lifelong careers in skilled trades to Nova Scotians. Also really working to ensure that um, underrepresented groups and in Nova Scotia appreciate the opportunities uh, that a career in skilled trades would, would um, bring to them um, so that we have very targeted campaigns to promote skilled trades among, among women, for example, among Mi'kmaq and Indigenous populations as well as African Nova Scotian populations. Um, we also have a population growth campaign underway right now, which is specifically um, targeting skilled trades and healthcare workers across Canada to bring their, their skills to Nova Scotia and uh, come job ready and there's opportunities here for them. And then, of course, uh, working with people who are looking at a career change to appreciate, help them understand the many options that are available to them in skilled trades. And then finally, um, looking to retain people that start the apprenticeship journey and perhaps don't complete it. So helping those, those um, folks um, finish their apprenticeship journey and, and become a, a journey person in a skilled trade. So there's, there's many approaches that we're taking to ensure that, um, that people uh, access careers in skilled trades. Um, in terms of, of accessing our services, um, Age doesn't matter, they, they, it, it, and we do offer individualized services. So um, when, when an, someone comes to our Nova Scotia Works office, they're offered customized service, comp just taking where they are in their journey and working with them to help them, um, to, to help them along and, and realize what their career goals are. So we have a number of programs in place, but it all starts with understanding the individual situation what they want for their career, what skills they have, and, and where they might want to go with those skills. And also then appreciating what the opportunities are, both in their community and throughout Nova Scotia. I'll just check with uh, Ms. Hodnot to see if I left anything out there. Ms. Hodnot? No, I think, I think that's good. So just to reiterate, um, and with a, with a workforce like this, um, you know, Nova Scotia Power has really good details on the individuals, their career, their training, who is likely to be impacted and where they are in their career, early career, mid career, or late in their career. So all of those things will factor into the work that NS Power is doing uh, with their employees. And at the end of the day, as, as, as the deputy has said, there's no age or demographic or, or uh, uh, location across the province that impacts any of the supports that we would provide. They're there for anyone who's interested. Uh, they're there to help people make some career decisions. Uh, they're there to help individuals understand with the current skill set that they have, where are the opportunities, and those things are available across the province um, and 12 months of the year to anyone who sort of wants to access those services. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to uh, MLA Lachance. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And my question is also for Deputy Minister Zappale um, and perhaps Ms. Hodnot, and actually follows on quite nicely from the previous question. So again, I just wanted to explore a bit around community planning. So we're talking about transitioning individuals, but individuals are part of communities. And if we think about so, um, you know, we're talking about coal mining communities because there's such a long history and uh, attrition and culture. So I think, uh, on one hand, it's great to hear about what's available for individuals, but I'm also really still very interested to understand 
what's happening at the community level. And I'm wondering perhaps if you could comment on, on what you understand about the particular challenges in each community, uh, that each community is changing um, or, ch or facing and I, you know, and I think you know the question around age is really important because that that may have a different answer depending on where your community is. Not that there's a barrier to to showing up for services, but that there is realistically contextual issues that need to be taken into account. So I'm wondering about specifically those, yeah, those that that bridge from individual to understand the individual in their context and what's been hap what you understand as the challenge for each community. Thank you, MLA. Um, I'm, I think that's for deputy. Is that correct? Yes, please. Uh, start. Well, I'll start, and then I may need to draw on my colleagues' expertise. But uh, thanks for the question, and it gets completely to the heart of the the matter, which is how do you assist um, individuals in transitioning their their careers, and then what what about the community? How how does the community also um, transition from supporting a sector to perhaps um, uh, supporting employees in another sector or a variety of sectors. So just um, to reiterate uh, the previous point is that um, on the first part, individuals um, are treated individually. They all have different um, uh, hopes and dreams and objectives and they're all in different places in their careers and, and some may have um, a skill set which uh, which will be required by Nova Scotia Power and may be remaining in their jobs and others may be um, transitioning to something completely and then you have a spectrum in between and, and there might even be some people who aren't quite sure what they want to do and they just need to sit down and talk to somebody and, and get a, a bit of information and, and a helping hand uh, um, to assist them with whatever that transition transition looks like as they as their um, understanding of what they want in their career evolves. So on that piece, um, we're good at that. We have in community supports for that. Um, they, we, are, we have fifth, over 50 locations for our Nova Scotia Works offices. So all of the communities that uh, would be affected by this transition uh, would have a Nova Scotia Works office nearby with, with skilled professionals ready to help. And that's at any time. So um, in terms of the community, um, I believe there was a question similar to that earlier. And I, I did make note that um, one of our government departments, uh, Natural Resources and Renewable is looking, is currently undertaking a bit of a, an analysis of a broader impact in terms of what um, this transition might mean to the larger community. So we'll be working with um, NRR and our partners to just have a, a bigger appreciation of what the impact might, might mean in each community and also be ready to support um, that transition in the role that we can support it. So that role would be um, assisting with labor market information, um, helping with um, apprenticeship programming and promotion, um, promoting the Nova Scotia works offices and the, the variety of services that we've mentioned today, and uh, lending a hand if necessary to the employer as well to see if there's anything further we can do to help employers transition. Um, Nancy, can I ask if you have anything further to add? Ms. Hodnon? So not much to add except just to say that when these kinds of things happen in local communities, um, the magic around the planning actually happens at a very community level. And we are available as a government department to sit in and help with those things in the areas that the deputy mentioned. Uh, but if Nova Scotia Power has sort of these transition committees locally already established, there may be some opportunities to broaden those out. Um, and then it becomes up to those community partners to sort of come to those tables and sit and be part of that planning. And that's probably the vision you see for those things. And, and when that happens, we're there. Uh, in other instances where things like this have happened and had, you know, uh, impacts at local levels, it's the chambers of commerce that come to the table as well. It's the regional enterprise networks. It's our Nova Scotia work centers. It's the local employer. And that's where those conversations happen. And, and coming back to something Scott said very early on, it's important to have really good information when you're doing that planning. So I think the work that's happening with government led by natural resources right now around what's that broader economic impact that could be felt in communities uh, with some of these transitions. So having that in hand and, and having the, the information that we can pull together and really good detailed labor market information across the province um, is helpful in that space. 
And, and at the end of the day, we're ready and able to join those tables and help facilitate some of those local conversations and planning uh, that will happen from now over the course of a number of years uh, as the transition unfolds. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Emily uh, Chander, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I hope to get back to that topic in a few minutes and to talk about why, uh, or ask about why, <laughs> maybe the government should take a, a more of a leadership role, uh, I think, in the just transition that we're facing. But my question now is for Mr. Gregg. And um, Mr. Gregg, uh, in your opening remarks, you talked about a focus on care for employees, families, and communities. And throughout the committee, you've talked a lot about affordability. Um, but we know that there is a application before the UARB, which would include a 10% rate increase over three years for customers, for rate payers, um, but at the same time would increase the rate of return for shareholders and in many ways would increase the profitability of your company in the meantime, uh, based on the ways that things are restructured. And so I wonder, uh, Mr. Gregg, uh, I mean, my real question is affordable for whom? But my question to you is, what are your plans to ensure that we meet our climate targets and make sure that bills remain affordable for Nova Scotians? I'll wait for the chair. Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. <laughs> Gregg. Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the question, Ms. Chender. Um, so, you know, a big part of, of our uh, general application to the uh, UARB has been to make investments to support the transition that we've been talking about here today um, to get to 80% renewables by 2030. And we need to be making those investments now uh, to make sure we hit those um, goals and also to make sure we do it in a way that is, as I said on a few occasions, as you mentioned, is as affordable for Nova Scotians uh, as is possible. Um, and so that was a, a huge consideration for us um, in making that application um, to the UARB. And I can tell you that you know as we progress uh, towards our 2030 uh, shared ambitions uh, for 80% renewables, we will always apply um, a really, really strict lens of, of affordability uh, as we make uh, those decisions. Um, we haven't um, been to the regulator for a general rate application in, in over a decade, um, and we never take it lightly uh, when we do have to go uh, forward. Um, but I think you know we do have a very strong independent regulator um, in this province uh, who will hear um, what we have to say, but will also hear the perspectives of others who are interveners in such a process, um, and we respect that process. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you sir. Uh, I have uh, MLA Kerr next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this one's for uh, Mr. Gregg as well. And I was pleased to hear that uh, there's local transition teams working and central transition teams working uh, with employees uh, throughout the province and throughout the plant. So I've, I've switched up my question. Uh, you had mentioned um, that there are other ways to achieve uh, our province's climate goals if the Atlantic Loop doesn't work out, uh, and I'm curious what those uh, other ways are. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would say, um, uh, back to my previous, um, sorry, Mr. Chair, I jumped ahead of you. I know you were going to... I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks for the question. And, you know, in answering the previous question, what I was trying to illustrate was that, you know, as planners for a complex grid serving all Nova Scotians, we need to be planning for multiple scenarios uh, all the time. That's part of our DNA as a company. It's part of the DNA of, of utilities uh, more broadly. Um, and so, you know, are there other ways of getting there? There are. Um, we are very, very focused, though, on, on our plan A, which includes the Atlantic Loop. That's where our attention is. We've done the analysis that says this is the 
the best option for Nova Scotians that pr provides the uh, the most affordable option to get there. We need help um, from the federal government. 55% um, of the cost of getting off coal for Canada um, is going to be born in Nova Scotia and we're 3% of Canada's population. And that just illustrates why, why we need that help. And so we're confident that um, our shared approach um, to the Plan A, which includes the Atlantic Loop, is the right way to go. <clears throat> that is the subject of ongoing, in-depth conversations with multiple parties at the table. Um, and we have confidence in that. Um, I didn't want to say that, you know, we're looking at other options because um, that plan isn't going to work. We have confidence in that plan and that's where our focus is, but we wouldn't be um, good utility planners if we hadn't thought through other ways of getting there if we need to. But again, I would illustrate and highlight that uh, we think we've got the best plan uh, and uh, we'll continue to be focused on that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, MLA uh, Richie next and uh, just uh, then Smith and then we're uh, going over to the uh, uh, third trip around at Boudreau, Marquette, Chender and Richie. So uh, Emily Richie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, as a result of Bill 57 being introduced this past fall sitting, Nova Scotia has become a leader in the country when it, com become, uh, when it comes to setting ambitious targets for its transition to energy efficiency. This, uh, this question is directed to uh, Mr. Mr. Gregg. Uh, could you tell us if there is, to your knowledge, an ongoing effort to communicate between provinces as we learn how to be better undergo this transition from coal? Thank you, Mr. Gregg, please. Yes, and thank you for the question. Um, I'll do my best to, to uh, answer that. Um, start by saying, you know, the, the transition <clears throat> we're contemplating here in Nova Scotia <clears throat> is a transition that other jurisdictions are obviously <clears throat> dealing with as well. Um, we've obviously got more of a concentration of coal uh, in our province than, than you see in other parts of the country <clears throat> currently. And so the challenges are, are going to be unique in each jurisdiction. But we have been um, engaged, as I mentioned before, with our neighboring colleagues uh, in very in-depth discussions. So. Um, Mr. Sidebottom and I meet regularly with our colleagues at uh, New Brunswick Power to um, talk about ways to uh, to move uh, off of coal um, jointly and to serve the needs of, uh, of our neighboring jurisdictions. Those conversations are also happening um, with our colleagues in Quebec, at Hydro-Quebec, on a regular basis. <clears throat> um, and they also involve provincial governments from both New Brunswick uh, and Quebec, as well as the federal government. So those discussions are ongoing. We also regionally have discussions. As you know, we get power um, through the Maritime Link now. And so ongoing discussions with Newfoundland that have been underway for a long time, and those continue to happen as well with our colleagues uh, in, uh, in PEI. So yes, there are shared discussions around the shared journey. Um, and uh, we're really trying to take more of a regional approach. Um, we think is the is the best approach to, to manage the transition and that um, I also have an opportunity to interact with um, my colleagues across the country through the Canadian Electricity Association. Uh, I sit on the board of that association um, and we talk about net zero ambitions legislation at the federal level um, and how we're all going about it. So it's a real benefit to get the perspectives from all of those leaders in the sector um, and share our perspectives as well to make sure that we're all focusing on, on the right solutions. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I have MLA Smith next, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, earlier in the conversation, I heard one of the witnesses talk about, uh, about rural and how uh, some things are happening in rural. It's not all happening in, in HRM. Um, well, I happen to, to represent part of HRM, but I can tell you that the communities of Ecom Seacom and Sheet Harbor and Seaforth, although in HRM, would not be, would not be considered urban, they would be rural. Uh, so with that being said, something like the consumer first, pardon me, customer first renewable initiative for the RFP for wind and solar, how can something like that be beneficial to those rural communities that I spoke of? Uh, Mr. Skinner is who I'd like to have address this to, please. Mr. Skinner, please. Yes, th thank you for the, the question. Um, 
You know, that, that in my understanding is, a, is an open call. So it would be dependent on the companies that respond to the, uh, to the, to the RFP and if those companies have a, a site located in, in that area of the province. Um, I, you know, at, at this stage, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, what's going to be submitted in there. And I know there's been a lot of groundwork done by uh, many of the renewable, uh, especially wind companies um, in, in that have been around the province for a while. But uh, it would be hopeful that, um, you know, the, the sort of the benefits of this procurement and, and future procurements, you know, find their way into local benefits for many of the renewable uh, rural or, um, communities in the province. Thank you very much, sir. And so now I've, I'm third time around and uh, MLA Boudreau, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, uh, interesting topic. We've heard a couple of different um, witnesses talk about the jobs, the 11,000 jobs, uh, you know, will be needed or, or maybe even more. Um, and some of the construction that's going on in Cape Breton right now in, in those near, near locations to these, to these generating plants. And that brings me to a different type of conversation or different kind of question, which is, is there an operational risk to these coal plants if employees start leaving? For some of these jobs that you know now that they're anticipating a plant closure so is there is there any kind of a, any way of Nova Scotia power addressing that so maybe to mr. Greg mr. Greg please you're busy <laughs> well I think I'm gonna um, invite mr. Sidebottom in he's our chief operating officer so it's probably appropriate that he answers that question yeah, that's okay, okay. mr. Sidebottom please thank you so uh, you're absolutely right um, making sure that our employees feel valued through the transition and committed to a safe operation is uh, really one of our core principles. And, you know, it's very much a part of why we have set up local transition teams uh, and, and had an ability to have a conversation uh, with employees as they see the transition occur. Um, this year, to give you a sense, is we're, we're going to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with all of those employees so that we'll get a deeper understanding of what they aspire to do, uh, what, uh, what, what worries them, and how to chart a path forward. So engaging on an individual basis so that we can give the best possible transition. Some employees may want to retire. Others may want to work within the organization in, in the new structure that exists in the clean generation framework. And others might, in fact, be uh, really interested in being in the community and one of the other uh, job skills. So, you know, that and working very closely with the employees over that period is, is key. And making sure that, you know, while we do this, uh, we understand how the transition will look and feel for them and how they can understand how they can productively finish one part of a career and then transition into another part of a career. And it speaks to very close coordination as we build out training uh, with uh, the communities and the opportunities along with those inside the company. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, sir. I have MLA Mamarquette next. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to ask another question. Um, and, and I'll go back to some of the comments uh, that uh, were said by uh, Mr. Craig around the, the rationale for the rate increase to help support uh, the transition uh, from, from coal to, to renewables. Um, so there's the rate increase, but there's also the ask for the federal government, which I suspect is a very significant number, which I don't have in front of me. So, so my question uh, to no, either representative from Nova Scotia Power is, you're looking for a rate increase, but you're also looking for a significant ask from the federal government to help support the transition. So can you provide the committee with a breakdown of what that money will look like and where that money will be going uh, if the federal government is to commit uh, to that uh, envelope of money along with your, your ask for a rate increase to the UARB. Who's going to take that, uh, Greg or Mr. Sidebottom? Greg, Mr. Greg? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mubberkett, for the uh, excellent question. Um, so 
we start by saying we need to make the early investments in our plan to get to 2030. As I mentioned before, 2022, so it's, it's not that far away. And really those investments are investments in enabling the grid to be ready for the coal shutdown and the replacement of either renewable generation, or it'll be both renewable generation in the province of Nova Scotia, but also bringing renewable generation across transmission lines um, into, into the province of Nova Scotia. And so it's investments like we need to make in grid scale batteries placed in different spots across the province to enable that optimization of the renewable energy deployment um, in in the province. And that's part of what the province's RFP for new wind, they want to add um, uh, several hundred megawatts of new wind in the province. Um, we think that's the right thing to do is more renewables as part of the plan. And so we need to make sure the grid can uh, handle that um, and manage that uh, intermittent energy reliably. And so that's why we need to make investments like grid scale batteries uh, onto, onto our grid. Your question around, so there are costs in doing that now uh, that we made an application to uh, the regulator for. And you're right, we're having parallel conversations seeking um, a significant contribution uh, from the federal government to make the transition an affordable one. One of the elements that's in our application is uh, the concept of introducing what's called a, uh, a decarbonization deferral account. And I won't go into all of the uh, all of the machinations of that. It's something that would need to be approved by the regulator. Um, but it is uh, essentially an account that is, if if approved, we could utilize it to minimize the cost pressure on uh, Nova Scotians um, for. Um, achieving the transition to 2030. Um, and it's a mechanism by which, you know, if we were successful in uh, getting some federal funding to make it an affordable transition, it's something we can use to spread those, those costs out and make it an affordable transition, as I said. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we have, uh, I have uh, MLA Chander, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Gregg, since he brought up uh, the decarbonization uh, fund, that while I think as a financing mechanism, I'm sure smarter minds than I would uh, understand uh, that and, and the utility of spreading those costs over time. However, the impact on ratepayers is going to be essentially to bring back an efficiency tax, uh, which is, you know, I will remind folks, and I know, Mr. Gregg, you weren't um, in your role at the time, uh, the core thing that the Liberal government campaigned against when they were successful about eight and a half years ago. Um, and so while I absolutely understand the need to in, in shore up the grid and the grid size batteries and make sure that our grid can handle the shift, um, I think that there is a huge demand side management piece involved as well. And you know what we've been told is that between uh, the idea of, again, breaking out essentially an efficiency tax onto people's bills, which is what this will look like, uh, and um, the proposed uh, net metering change to solar, which happily has been withdrawn, um, but which really uh, seemed to have the possibility of crippling the solar industry in Nova Scotia. Uh, you know, my question is how, how do these fit with this climate target? Um, how, you know, how is Nova Scotia Power proactively, in fact, moving forward with partners uh, in industry and community to ensure that we can meet those climate targets in a way that's distributed? Um, because uh, we are hearing a lot of fear from the community um, that, again, this latest application to the UIRB, which I understand is an independent body and will evaluate it, is raising a lot of red flags for people. Mr. Gregg, please. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Ms. Chander, for, for the question. Um, I'll give you, I guess, a couple of different elements to the response to that question. Um, one is certainly demand side management um, is an important part of the transition. <clears throat> Absolutely needs to be. Um, and we support that. Um, we've got to have efficiency programs, um, and, uh, and we do definitely support that and uh, ongoing discussions with the uh, efficiency one. And I think we've had a very productive working relationship with Efficiency One as well, and expect that to, to continue. So that is part of the future. 
Um, but we've also got to um, make sure that other elements of, of the transition are an affordable uh, one as well. Um, I'll give you, you know, we've, I mentioned in the beginning uh, in my opening remarks that we've, we've come a long way in Nova Scotia where, you know, last year we achieved 30% uh, of our power supply to Nova Scotians was from renewable resources and that was up from 9% a decade earlier. And with consistent flows over the maritime link, uh, which is now happening, we're getting those flows over the maritime link, that'll enable us to get to 60% renewables. And so we have been really, over the last decade or more, making uh, prudent investments uh, to ensure that we can uh, not only hit um, more aggressive climate targets, that, um, but also to make sure that we do that in, a, in an affordable way, to make sure we maintain reliability, um, for, for our customers as well, and we're fully committed to that. And the next phase of that plan is a, is a broad approach to making sure we hit 80% renewables, again, doing that reliably, safely, and affordably. Um, and it's not only us. We need, we need uh, many, many partners to be involved in this. There will be others who will contribute by building wind in the province. Um, there will be uh, others uh, participating on uh, the demand side management uh, side of it. Um, there are others, um, it's a big transition. It's gonna include, uh, it's gonna require a lot of collaboration from many parties and, uh, and we're committed to collaborating. <coughs> Thank you very much. And uh, MLA Palmer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to address this question, um, I think, to uh, Ms. Sapele or Ms. Hodnot. Um, you discussed earlier uh, how the uh, Nova Scotia Apprentice Agency, and uh, we've talked about uh, our Nova Scotia Community College system, uh, can do a lot of things in this transition period. And I'd like to, um, I guess, ask you to reiterate and expand on, uh, I guess, what we should be asking of them to engage with us to develop and implement um, upskilling options now uh, as we're going forward. Thank you. Uh uh, Deputy, please. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And, and there's no doubt that there will be a need for skilled trades workers. There's skilled trades people working with Nova Scotia Power, and uh, we have a great need for skilled trades workers throughout Nova Scotia. So, um, you know, anything that we can do to help those workers who want to work in other sectors um, transition, that, that would be our pleasure and we have many programs and individualized ways of assisting them to make that transition. So uh, I'll just start by saying that. Um, so in, in this particular instance, um, most of the workers w would have, I'm assuming, been employed with Nova Scotia Power for uh, a number of years and probably have some career experience that they would need assistance with translating into what does that look like uh, whether they transition to a new career within Nova Scotia Power or whether they want to take that, that set of skills and um, utilize those in another, in another uh, type of work outside of Nova Scotia Power. So, so the first job would be to determine what their skills are. Um, you know, some, some employers may, you know, may, have, may need assistance in understanding that they actually have a skill set that's very applicable to another trade. And that's, that's work that we do all the time is, is talk to individuals, um, talk about their skills, talk about their interests, where they are in their career and what they would like to do moving forward and help guide them along that, that path. So I still recall a story where um, someone had been working for many years in an industry and he approached me and he said that um, he was going, about to be laid off and he had no skills. But did, and I asked, what, what have you done? And he said, well, I've driven a forklift for 30 years. He had a lot of skills. Driving a forklift in an industrial setting requires a great number of skills. And through talk and conversation with the apprenticeship agency, ultimately he was able to uh, challenge for an exam and became a journey person in a related field. So um, working with employees to help them understand their skill set and how that translates into um, other opportunities is what we do. We also have a great partner in NSCC and work very, very closely with NSCC. We have a joint stewardship 
agreement with NSCC. They're on the board of the apprenticeship agency. We work very, very closely with them from a policy level, a program level, and also uh, assisting individuals with their path. If we talk to the individual and we feel um, after the conversation there's a role for NSCC, we'll bring them in as helping, helping uh, uh, that individual to understand what the options are with their, with their career goal. So I'll just check with um, my colleague, Ms. Hodnot, to see if she has anything to add to this piece. So I, I would only add that in a broader context, as we talk about the green economy, we have prioritized uh, um, clean and green in a, as a priority across a number of our supports in our programs. So whether it's a co-op, work integrated learning placement, or helping individuals connect to their first job post-graduation through graduate to opportunity, green is a priority that we look for and want to support in those, uh, in those students and young people attaching to jobs. The other piece is through our sector council program, where we work across 13 different industry sectors in this province, uh, we know that uh, you know, a clean economy has impacts across most sectors. And so as we work with those sectors in their strat plans and in their their programming to upskill and train and support employ employers in those sectors, that is another priority that we come through the sector uh, initiative. So we have sort of um, infused, if you will, green and the green economy as a priority in all of the, the programs that we offer and in all of our work with, uh, with sectors and employers across the province. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've got uh, 10 minutes and two questions. We have got the uh, MLA uh, Boudreau and then uh, Mama Cat, and then we're gonna call it uh, to go to regular business, okay? MLA uh, Boudreau, please. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'm gonna go back to asking a question to uh, Mr. Greg from uh, Nova Scotia Power. And um, just with regards to workers again, um, this might be an obvious answer to this question, but, but maybe not. But, um, but will the closures of, of um, the, uh, the uh, generation stations impact current or former workers' pensions? Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Boudreau. <clears throat> um, there's no um, contemplated change to, to pensions um, that uh, we're thinking about as this, this transition. Um, and so I think that's probably the, the, the most direct answer is that uh, no, no changes. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Mommerkett, if you want to close it off, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. I thank you, Mr. Chair, for the final question. And this is to, to, to Jim. Um, uh, first, I'll say, listen, uh, if you can pass along from, from all of us our thanks to all the employees at Nova Scotia Power who keep the lights on uh, for us uh, in, all, in all five seasons we have here in, in, in Nova Scotia. Um, uh, please do so. Uh, it's incredible to see everybody go to work, uh, especially when we need just the most and, and some of the weather that we've been receiving lately. So please pass along my best. I guess I just want to finish off by just really giving you an opportunity to talk about um, how, how the employees are really feeling about the transition. We all knew it was coming. Um, in, in Cape Breton, we've been in a lot of positions in, in, in the past where we've seen sudden closures of coal mines or steel plants and it's affected communities across the island. Um, we have an opportunity now to really get it right. We have a number of years before some of these changes are going to be made. So, you know, we've all been advocating for the last number of years to, to really have this conversation and I appreciate and uh, hearing that that those conversations are happening with Nova Scotia Power and, and within communities. So, so I'll, I'll let you finish it off by just talking about how employees are feeling about the transition and and because uh, as you said, you know, we, we don't want we don't want anybody who wants to continue to work at Nova Scotia Power to have to leave. So, so um, if you want to just elaborate on the gym, that would be great. And again, thank you to you and all of the workers uh, at NSP. Mr. Sp <coughs> Spinnacle, please. Yes, uh, so I guess at the end of the day, uh, we, we, we spoke to this already. Uh, just to my background, I worked in every thermal plant across the province. I'm from Glace Bay. I'm Cape Bretoner. And certainly, uh, again, Cape Bretoners are resilient as are the rest of our workforce uh, throughout the province. Uh, and uh, you can see that by the past month and a half since the new year, there's been a storm every, every uh, weekend pretty much. Uh, and uh, the lights remain on. Um, again, uh, 
I, I look at it at the glass half full, and I believe uh, my members, uh, you know, at the end of it, it is what it is. And, you know, there, there is a challenge, and we're going to try to meet the challenge head on. Uh, we're going to work with the employer to, to leverage or maximize every opportunity we can. I, again, uh, you know, whether it be wind energy or, uh, you know, battery storage or whatever, it, it's going to look like down the road, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, whether or not we get there on the timelines that are, uh, you know, etched in stone remains to be seen. You know, like, again, I, I, I worked in Nova Scotia Power since 1995 and, uh, and to take off uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 eight plants, uh, coal plants, eight different units is a, our assiduous task. And if we don't have a good plan, it's, it's going to be a difficult transition. Um, again, I, I, I think we'll transition together. Uh, I'll work with the employer. And I got excuse. Uh, we're doing work here in the building. We lost some siding, so you might hear some banging. Um, it's been going on for the last three hours. But uh, look, we'll work together. And my members, uh, you know, my members are resilient. And uh, like I say, uh, I, I, it's not the glass half empty. It's the glass half filled. It is what it is. And we'll uh, we'll move forward together. So I appreciate the good question. But that's. Uh, that's my answer. Again, my phone isn't uh, ringing off the wall about, uh, you know, doom and gloom, we're going to lose everything. Uh, it is what it is, and we'll, we'll, we'll work with the employer to maximize, and we'll work with the government we have to. We've got the Federation of Labor, uh, Danny Kavanaugh, the president, he works uh, with the, 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 the premier, uh, you know, he works with MLAs on uh, trying to ensure that we maximize benefit. To, Again, there there are folks. There's uh, there's critics, uh, government critics out there, and we, we talk to uh, on occasion. And again, we're all about trying to maximize uh, what we can maximize through throughout the transition. Thank you very much. So that that concludes the uh, question and answer period. I'm, uh, I wonder if the uh, witnesses, and I'll start with. Uh, Labor skills and immigration uh, would like to make any closing remarks, uh, uh, Deputy, Deputy uh, Zappoli. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, look, we we know that Nova Scotians who work in this sector are highly skilled, and Nova Scotia needs their skills and their talents to help fill current and future labor market needs. So the Department of Labor Skills and Immigration is ready working with sectors and employers to address labor gaps and helping people attach to labor market opportunities is what we do. So we're here and we're, we're ready uh, to play our role in, in supporting this transition. And uh, just wanted to uh, thank my colleagues today for their support. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Hodnott, do you have any closing remarks? remarks? No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank the committee um, for you know a very good discussion today. So thank you for for your kind attention to the issue. <clears throat> Much appreciated. And I also want to say, you know, how proud I am of Nova Scotia Power employees for the work they do. You heard Mr. Mumberkit touch on that, and the oftentimes very challenging conditions. Um, and I put our employees up against anybody's employees. They're incredibly well skilled. <laughs> Um, and uh, and committed uh, to the work they do. And we've got to make sure we do what is right for them, what's right for their families, and what's right for the communities in which they live. And we are committed to that as a, as a company. And in partnership with Jim and his union, we'll continue to do that. But this is something we're all going to need to work on together. And I think with the support of government uh, for programs that would help um, in that transition um, and others as well. Um, it's it's a concentrated collaborative effort that's going to be there, but uh, we're, we're committed to making sure that we do what's right for our employees. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Sidebottom, do you have any comments? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sponico, please, if you uh, have comments. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. On behalf of my members that I represent, I thank you all for your time. Uh, certainly, it's good to, to discuss issues uh, that lie in front of us. Um, my phone is always on. If anyone needs to get hold of me or reach out to me uh, in regards to uh, continued dialogue and discussion on, on the issue of transition, again, I'm only a phone call away. And uh, look, again, I want to thank Nova Scotia Power. Like I say, although we're in the infancy stages, uh, 
you know, they, they've engaged with the union on uh, on the issue. And uh, like I say, continue to look forward to working with them as we go through the process. Uh, you know, when it, as it relates to Nova Scotia Power and Government, you know, the union certainly would like to be closer with some of them discussions. And uh, as the uh, transition unfolds, maybe that happens. But uh, like I say, uh, I'm sure we'll all get through it and uh, we'll endure and uh, it'll all work out the end. Thank you. Mr. Skinner. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and thanks for inviting me to contribute today. Uh, as the others have mentioned, uh, you know, my organization is ready to help where, where we can uh, as we, you know, try to collectively transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, you know, I'll note before we leave that, you know, n none of these challenges sort of exist in isolation. Uh, we'll, we'll find that. Um, you know, as you're trying to address this uh, in community, we're also going to be dealing with things around housing challenges and energy poverty, uh, you know, community capacity to respond. So it's going to take us all working together and, and a lot of conversations and discussions like this. So, uh, you know, any opportunity to participate in the future, um, all you have to do is ask and I will be there. Thank you very much. I thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, if, uh, again, thanks. Uh, for your time this afternoon. Been, I believe it's been a great discussion. And uh, if you folks uh, want to leave, that would be dandy. And we'll carry on with the, with the committee business. Thank you very much. So the, uh, the first uh, piece of, uh, I guess the only piece of uh, committee business I have is, uh, is the venue for March 22nd. Do we have uh, MLA? Yeah, MLA uh, Smith, please. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yeah, venue for our next meeting in light of the uh, the lifting of some of the public health restrictions. I'd like to move that we resume in-person meetings for this committee. Moved by MLA Smith. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Ritzy? Uh, any uh, discussion, questions? Please, yep. MLA Chender, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I think that makes sense. I know that in some other committees, there sometimes when there are a large number of witnesses, it makes sense to run the committee as we did today. So I'd love to leave discretion for that with the clerk's office, just to make sure that we're meeting all the guidelines and people feel safe. But otherwise, we would support this. Yeah. Everybody's uh, comfortable with that? Any other questions, uh, discussion, concerns? If not, I'll call for the question. All, all in favor. I don't know if I can do that, but anyway, right. I did. Contrary minded. So, uh, any other business? Um, so, our next meeting, uh, Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022 at 1 o'clock. Uh, topic will be renewable energy. Uh, uh, progress towards targets, and we will have uh, witnesses will be uh, Karen Gation, uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Renewables, uh, Keith Collins, Executive Director of Clean Energy, and uh, David Miller, Director of Clean Energy. I think they're both from uh, Natural Resources and Renewables. So uh, that's our next meeting, and uh, I think I'm allowed to call for adjournment myself, aren't I? So I'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much.